Hello, everyone, and welcome to all of you who have joined us today for a fantastic learning opportunity. On behalf of OutSchool and the community team, we are so glad to see you and look forward to learning and growing with you in this first ever experience that we've had, where we're bringing our parents and our educators together uh, to, to learn So, in with an author, so our first author visit. So thank you, Rachel. Um, for joining us. So each of you are here because you recognize that when we provide young people with the in agency to do amazing things, they tend to do just that. So I hope that through what we all learn today, you'll be better equipped to guide learners in their explorations, support their passions, and help them to see how they can turn their passions for the outdoors into learning experiences. So we'd like you to feel free to put in the comments here, questions, and we will get to that. And feel free to introduce yourselves as well. We're gonna be monitoring the chat to support our Q&A, and that's gonna be at the end. But if you do see, you do think of a question, you can go ahead and place it there for us. And I am so excited today to bring together with all of you, Rachel Tidd, part of, um, who is the author of Wild Learning, Practical Ideas to Bring Teaching Outdoors. And I'm gonna do a quick shout out too, because our educators have been reading and discussing your book, Rachel, and Maria and Cindy are here in the, in the audience. And so Maria and Cindy, feel free to drop in some of your tidbits too, as we go along. So I want to do a quick shout out and thank you to Jennifer, who is our partnership <coughs> lead here at OutSchool, who um, really cultivated this relationship with Rachel to bring her here for all of you. So Rachel, I'm going to turn it over to you and have you introduce yourself and tell us more and then go on in your presentation. Well, I'm so excited to be here um, and talking with all of you and parents and teachers um, and about my favorite topic, which is learning outside and bringing it all together with teaching and parenting. Um, I'm just going to rearrange my screen so I can see the chat-ish. Um, and then I will start our slide. So... Um, I always like to start um, every presentation with a little uh, path, learning path of where we're going to go and what we're going to do so that you have an idea of what we're doing. Um, so I'll start with an introduction about myself and why I think the outdoors is so important to bring into children's lives. And then I'll go into um, some ideas and hopefully inspiration for you to integrate nature into your teaching practice, whether that is in the classroom, um, at home, or in the virtual environment um, as well. And then we'll move into connecting with nature at home, some more specifics um, of ideas that you can do this in with your own children. And then I'll end with time for um, questions, whether you have them at the end or some people submitted some and I would love to know how I can help you so this is your chance um let's see here so um I'd love to see in the chat um who you are just so I have an idea of who I'm talking to you are you and you don't have to answer all of them it's just are you an out school teacher are you a classroom teacher are you a parent and maybe the ages of um the students that you work with. I would love to see that. Um, you can work on that and I will keep going and talk about. So about me, I'm Rachel, like they said, my name is Rachel Tidd and I am the author of the new book, Wild Learning, Practical Ideas to Bring Teaching Outdoors. And I also wrote a K through five math curriculum as well as um, a reading curriculum called Wild Re Reading and Wild Math. Um, and that's kind of my claim to fame. I used to be a special education teacher uh, at the elementary level, and I taught in New York City and upstate New York. And I'm also a parent of two boys who kind of inspired me down this road of integrating um, the outdoors into learning. And um, 
I'm also a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in educational sustainability. And I always like to take a minute just to acknowledge um, that the land on which I work and teach and live is the unceded territory of the Gayakona people, the Cayuga Nation. Um, and I acknowledge their stewardship of this place throughout the centuries and today. And I encourage you to find um, out about the people who um, whose land it was before we were here and um, who are stewards of it today. So I'm gonna move right on to um, why I love the outdoors so much. Um, so we are often as educators and parents working really hard to provide um, experiences that are hands-on or increase, we're trying to increase engagement and attention and motivation. Um, we want our children to be healthy, our students to be healthy. And when we go outside, it happens that it's been proven through studies after studies um, that it increases attention, it decreases ADHD symptoms, um, Kids are more engaged, they're more motivated. That effect, I've seen some studies that that effect of increased attention, engagement, and motivation carries through even to the next activity. So if you go outside and do something, it doesn't even have to be a change in the lesson or the activity. Say you were just taking reading outside or you took the exact same activity outside and then you go back in the effects of attention, engagement, and motivation actually last into your next um, activity. So you kind of get a two for one deal. Um, going outside doesn't usually cost us anything. It's um, an available resource that we all have available. And I say that to everybody I did teach in the city um, and there is nature and outdoor um, opportunities everywhere. You just have to know where to look and how to use them. And um, going outside also builds a relationship with the natural world and their community. I do a lot with um, going outside in a neighborhood or whatever is around your school or a home. Um, and when kids have that relationship, they're more likely to care and act and as adults care and act and make a difference and make decisions that um, help us have a healthier and more sustainable world. So it's a, it's a good reason to get our kids outside. So I'm gonna start with um, some ideas for taking lessons into the natural world. And when I say natural world, it doesn't always have to look like this. It can be a backyard, it can be a city street, and I will try to give, um, hopefully give some examples of all of those. Um, one of my favorite ways to get kids outside and really start noticing and building a relationship with the natural world that's really easy and doesn't require a lot of planning is sit spots. Um, a sit spot is just a special spot that the children choose. Um, it doesn't have to be um, anything elaborate. It just has to be somewhere. It could even be not like, like in a neighborhood or a town. Um, and they just sit there for a few minutes, short if they're young, longer if they're older, and they observe. And then I might have them write down some of those observations in a notebook. That's the first time. Um, we return to that same spot over and over. So we're building a relationship with that spot and they kind of come to see it as their own. And then I like to pair it with writing activities. And so I use this as a jumping off point to do some more writing and get them writing about different things. Um, it's a great way to help children and adults slow down a little bit in our fast paced world um, and really key in to really small changes in details, um, which is a, a core uh, skill we want kids to have and it's a great science skill. So here are some of uh, ways I like to integrate writing. So like I said, observations are the first thing I usually have kids do. For younger kids, I usually um, have them draw something and then add labels. Um, older kids often will start with a drawing and then I have them add to their drawing, add detail, and then add some sentences that describe. And then older kids like middle school, high school, they are absolutely welcome to draw. Um, 
that's a great way, but I also have them add some writing and they are able to do much more writing about um, their observations. I also like to have them do a map activity. This is the one you can see the big white pine right here. That was the title. And um, the student drew and then I had them write some um, I like to have kids label scientific drawings. It's a really good science skill. And then they also added a compass rose, which is a great connection to um, social studies and um, geography skills. So that can be really fun to do. Um, then I also do a lot of nature journaling. So we would zero in on a specific plant or an animal or some um, inanimate object like a rock, um, something that they see and are interested in and really zoom into it and um, find out more about it and write, you know, draw a detailed picture of just that thing, noticing all the details and describing it. And then SitSpot News, which is um, on the next slide. So SitSpot News is this, um, I also call it SitSpot Times, depending on um, what I'm doing. And um, it's basically looking at their sit spot and thinking about if they were a news reporter reporting on this spot what would be the headlines? And we start there, we start with the headlines. And this student said, um, this was like at the end of fall. So they said, winter, what's that? The feared but inevitable change is starting. Um, and then they drew a picture of one of the signs that they had seen geese flying south. Um, and then glut of apples overwhelms home cook. So there was an apple tree nearby and they drew a picture of that. And they can get really kind of creative with this and it's really fun. For older kids, you could expand on this and have them write um, more on it. If you were doing this in a virtual environment, you would have kids go out and do this and then share. Um, and you can also have them share after they come from their sit spots, share with a group. Um, and that's really valuable too. This uh, other picture is the mind's eye. And that is um, looking at their sit spot um, from their mind's eye. So thinking of it, how I like to describe it as how you would you describe your sit spot to someone who had low vision or who was blind. And so you have to use your words and other senses and um, really do a good job of describing it. Um, so that can be a really fun. And if you're working with younger kids, you can do that orally too. Like, could you describe it to me, you know, in your, in your own words and you can do it orally. So that works out too. Um, another big topic that I love is birds, and I love birds because they're so accessible. Um, no matter where you are, you can um, probably find some birds to observe. Um, one of the best bird study units I ever did was actually in a New York City school on the Upper East Side. And um, they did a fabulous job. It was like a all second grade um, unit. And who knew that there was so many amazing birds in New York City? It's actually a migration stopover, that Central Park. So we would go over there and look for some birds. Um, but I love birds because there's so many links to other topics and it can go as deep as you want it. So if you have older kids, that's a great way to go deeper. Um, and for younger kids, it gets them looking around at their uh local environment, the environment around them, and it's them thinking about their place in the world. Um, so I usually start with some basic bird ID, and I am a little bit of a stickler for old-fashioned field guides, my kids will tell you, <laughs> um, because I feel like field guides hit so many um, different uh, goals that we're trying to teach kids anyway. We want them to know how to use a, uh, a reference material. We want them to be able to read nonfiction material. We want them to, um, it, they're often organized based on scientific concepts or geographic areas. And all of these are like kind of embedded in using the field guide. However, the Merlin app, which I'm going to talk about later, is also fantastic. It's super user-friendly and nothing beats for a very quick 
ID of a bird or a bird if you can't see it because it can identify help you identify birds just from their sound or from a picture. So um, we'll talk about that in a bit. Bird language is also a great way to get kids into birds. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, watching bird behavior is an excellent way for kids to collect data. Um, and data is really big in math right now um, because data and using data and interpreting data is such a big part of how we use math every day now. Um, if you just think about all those st statistics about the pandemic that we were constantly bonded with, like we just saw so many graphs and data and case numbers and how they got those numbers and interpreting which ones mattered. Um, it's really important in our world right now. So if we can get kids using data, um, even if it's just a tally chart or a bar graph and then moving up, it's a great way to do it. And you can do it anywhere as long as you can see birds. And if you can't, there's nest cams, which we will talk about. Um, there are a ton of resources at this website, birds.cornell.edu K12, um, including um, videos of the basics of bird ID, which they start with like the bird shapes, um, which is a great way to do it. Some lesson plans, bird cams, games, all kinds of stuff. So if you're into that, I highly recommend it. All right, so I bet you didn't guess this, but I'm going to give you a quiz today, and I want to see if you can guess, let's see if this works this way, um, what this bird is. Any ideas? Go back to my presentation. I don't know if I can see the chat. I could play it again. Can you? I'm not sure we're hearing it. Oh, you can't hear it? That's really strange. Let me see if I have a certain setting that we need. Yeah, it opened up another window. So I wonder if I need to go to that window. Like share that window. We can try. We can skip it. We might have to skip it. You know what you can do is we can do it as homework. Oh, we can, oh yeah. So I will so put this because uh, well we're using the on the stream yard it's it's the sharing computer sound can be um, a little tricky here Jake I, I do get that yeah. so what how we're do gonna, I put something in the chat um how about I will I see it yeah. and I'm going to um I see it in a private chat who'd that go to did that go to you that went to me so I'm gonna go over and share I'll put it. that in that. I'm going to, I'm going to go take that to everybody. Oh, my else. might tell them what it is. I don't know. No, I don't think it will. No. Uh, I'm going to go share it, but thank you. All right. I can't All go right. to the next slide. Ooh. Because that'll tell you what it is. Well then. Okay. But I can, but they you can look. Ahead. It's fine. Okay. It's not a real quiz. It's a bird that you've known and it's a bird that you hear. And it's actually, let's see if we're ready. It's a blue jay. So it's a blue jay call. It's kind of a warning call. Um, and it's uh, a really common bird that once you hear it, you'll recognize it. But this one we can do without sound. What about this bird? This is a bird that a lot of people have seen, but uh, often misidentify it. Um, and I'm going to just keep going for time but these are this is an example of things you can do with kids um you can quiz them with bird sounds to help them learn how to identify birds um from their sound because often we hear them but we don't see them and then um i'm just moving my screen around and then also you can um have them start learning bird identification from what they look like um, and you can do different activities, um, quizzing kids and making it a fun competition and reviewing it um, in a digital environment like this. Um, it also works great on those big smart boards. Um, and um, the Cornell has some great um, recordings. Um, the one I picked was one that you couldn't see what it was so that you couldn't guess. Um, and there's also some books that have bird calls built into them, which are really fun. So this is a tufted titmouse. If that's what you guessed it, you are right. And um, 
it's a, one of my favorite little birds. They're so cute and they have these great little crests. And so once you start looking at different birds, you can talk about the bird shape. This is a songbird shape, um, that they have different parts like a crest. They're different beak shapes. They're different feet types. This is perching, not like a webbed foot like on a duck. Um, or a wading bird has long legs and different tail feathers and markings. There's all kinds of things to learn about um, and why and camouflage. And you can go so deep with the science links, the geography links, um, adaptations to their environment. Um, and that's why I love birds so much. Um, bird language is also something that a lot of people don't know about. Um, it makes sense when you learn about it, um, but kids love this and it makes them really turn, tune into their environment. Um, so basically, there are five different kinds of bird sounds or language, and um, they're going to be familiar to you. So one is like the alarm, and this is the one we hear when we walk into the woods, or a cat is in the neighborhood, and you hear kind of like that jay we just heard, you know, we hear that alarm sound, they're sounding the alarm, and all the birds are cheat, 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 right? Um, they're sounding the alarm. They're telling you what's up and they're telling all of their friends. Um, we also have the song, right? The songbirds that play the, uh, make the songs in the morning to welcome the day. Um, there's companion calling when they're calling from one to another. This is often mating. They're calling to their mate or their companion or they're wanting to know where the rest of them are. Uh, juvenile begging. I always think of my kids when I hear this one. Um, this is when mama comes to the nest and they're like, peep, 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 because they want to get food. Um, and they're telling her, I want, I'm hungry. Um, and male to male aggression or just aggression between birds if they're defending their nest. Um, and so you can have kids listen to for these sounds um, in their sit spots or anywhere that there are birds take data on them, to make a tally chart, um, describe what they're hearing. I usually have them phonetically write out the sounds they're hearing. So if they heard that J sound, the J, J, they can write that out. That also helps them with their sound to letter correspondence, which is a great reading skill. And then this um, PDF link in here is a great little overview of bird language. There's also um, a book called What the Robin Knows, which is an adult book um, about bird language, an entire book about bird language, and there are a couple um, kids' books about it as well. Um, and if you don't have access to birds for whatever reason, um, nest cams can also be useful for up-close views of bird behavior. And birdsounds.net has very clear bird calls that are recorded. And it also has, um, for some of the birds, the different kind of calls it makes and it, and it labels them like a juvenile or an alarm or whatever it may be. So that can be a useful place to look for examples. So quick talk about the Merlin app. Um, who is singing? This is great because it's a free app designed to help beginners. Um, kids are easily can use it. Um, it helps them identify birds using different clues. Um, and it says from the birds, but um, it can use, it can listen to all of the birds. That's what this picture is right here. It's listening to all of the birds in the environment. And then it's giving you the likely birds um, that those could be. And I just think that's so amazing. You can talk about the sound, you can talk about um, the physics of sound, you can talk about all of these different birds, where they are, click on them, it'll give them more information, it'll show their geographic area, their migration routes. It's amazing. It'll also, and I'll show on the next slide, help you identify birds with the three questions, like I mentioned, the bird shape, bird color, um, and what it's doing. Um, it can record and ID identify those bird songs, it can ID birds from photos, and it can keep track of a life list of birds. So ideas for using this Merlin app in an educational setting or as a parent, um, I like to record and share bird songs or sightings in a group. So often we will do this in a kind of like a morning meeting or at the beginning of a class. Um, 
to say, you know, go around and what's a nature sighting that you heard? Or if we're focusing on birds, what's a bird that you saw this week? Where did you see it? You know, or they might share a picture that they took or share a recording of a bird that all, all can work. Um, I like to, like I said, go over a bird call or a species each week and kind of grow their knowledge that way. Um, make a class or family life list. So keep track of all the birds that you see, whether it's just in the class and when you're out or just as a family when you're out or just collectively. Um, a lot of times when you go to a nature center, they have a collective list of um, usually bird sightings, but sometimes it's animal and where they saw them and when they saw them. Um, you can have kids research a particular bird. We did this in our bird study in New York City and um, the kids loved it and did a phenomenal job and were little experts, they were second graders in their particular bird that they did. And then they made a little a, a book and we shared them with parents and other people that we invited to our publishing party. Um, and then, like I said, collecting data, using a tally chart to track the different birds you see during a set time and use them to construct a graph and calculate different stats, you know, averages, uh, which bird do you see the most, the, you know, the mean, median mode. Uh, you can go into Excel and um, or Google Sheets and manipulate that data and make graphs. And um, you can also share that data. And um, there's a lot of citizen science um, projects, especially through Cornell, um, like the big backyard bird count and that kids can get involved in, classrooms can get involved in and um, submit that data. So that's another great way. These are just some nest cams. I wanted to show you the diversity available and how cool they can be. I took these screenshots a couple days ago this one um, is the Chesapeake Bay Osprey cam. There is, this is the beauty of a nest cam. You can't usually see an osprey nest from this angle. They are way up high, usually on telephone pole platforms, at least where I am. Um, and they have little highlight clips so you can see like the fledglings and all kinds of stuff. And then um, this one of the hummingbirds in Texas right now is very active and fun to watch. Great one for data. Um, and you can also expand beyond your geographic area and go worldwide. So these are some very different birds, Panama fruit feeders, um, eating fruit in Panama. And then you can talk about the rainforest and different um, things to do that. And that's at allaboutbirds.org slash cams. So... Again, worldwide, you can use bird cams. This is a picture of a hawk here in Cornell in Ithaca, New York, where I am. Um, and they have lots of little highlights when it um, met up with some other buddies and they like zoom in. It's very uh, elaborate. Um, you can observe the bird behavior and uh, any bird language that they're making in a close-up way that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, and you can use it to collect data virtually any time of the year. There's a lot of these that are just at feeders. And so you could take that data, take five minutes, make the data, and then uh, use that in a math lesson. Um, another quick one is I love plants. Um, so there's more out there than trees and grass. I was talking to a colleague this week and she's like, every time I ask the kids what's outside, they go trees and grass, um, which is true. However, there's so much more to plants than trees and grass. There are thousands of different plant species um, and uh, teaching kids about um, common characteristics of different plant families um, and different species can help them see the diversity out there in plants and start learning how to categorize them um, and classify, which is really important and thinking critically when they see an unknown plant, what, cat what uh, you know, characteristics do I see? What are their leaves like? Are they alternate? How many petals do they have? What is the sepal number? Um, all of these things. Um, and so often in our plant and science, especially at the elementary level, we focus on photosynthesis and uh, the parts of a flower. And so those are great. But when I look at that worksheet of a flower, flowers look really, really different, right, from different plants. And so um, 
when we show kids lots of different flowers and lots of different plants, um, they are able to apply that knowledge and see the differences. And um, it really gives a depth to that knowledge um, and grows their background knowledge, which will help them down the line um, in reading comprehension and science. So um, here's some um, work we were doing with Dame's Rocket, and I'm going to show you a plant family in the next slide. So I like to integrate plant to ID, like I said, with observation along a traditional plant and photosynthesis unit. Um, just like with birds, I focus on one family at a time um, and have them look for an example outside. Um, and take a picture to, or sketch it and then share the, the plant they found. So this is the dame's rocket and they're drawing it. I have some cards in a plant unit that um, has a whole bunch of um, different examples of different plants and different families and we use them um, in games to help us uh, remember them. Um, iNaturalist app is a great way to help uh, double check your identification if you're not super familiar with plants and help building your knowledge. And of course, my favorite, the old fashioned field guide. Um, I suggest if you are a parent or a teacher that you invest in some good field, field guides that are local to your area and have them available. So here's just an example of what I'm talking about if you're not super familiar with plants and plant families. Um, this is the mustard family. This is two different examples of the mustard family. And um, mustards are really, really common. Um, their biggest defining feature that can give you a clue that you might have a mustard, not always, remember, um, is it has four petals. Um, and so we look at that. Both of these plants have four petals. They also, here's your link to your... Uh, plant unit, it has four sepals. It has six stamens, four are tall and two are shorter. So already we're looking at the differences. Um, it has a peppery taste. However, I don't suggest you taste the plants unless you are sure you correctly identified the plant. And that usually means that you have verified it from two different sources. So if you're using the iNaturalist lamp, also get that field um, guide out. Um, this one right here is um, garlic mustard. It comes out in the spring. It's great for making pesto if you want to try that with your students or your children. I have a whole thing about it on my um, Instagram. And um, this one is Dame's Rocket, not to be confused with Phlox. If you look for, if you are looking at this and it looks similar, but it has five petals, you are looking at Phlox. Um, they're often um, mixed up, but that's a great way. And there's a whole bunch of other mustard family, but that can give you a little bit of glimpse of how a little bit of knowledge can support that basic science, but also um, introduce them to the wild biodiversity in the world of plants. And you can go super deep with this. So this is great for young kids or older kids and even adults. And then another big resource I always like to push on people is street trees. This is really great if you are in a more urban or developed area. Um, street trees are often purposely planted or have been there for a long time. And they are surprisingly a diverse amount of trees, right? Because they were chosen for their suitability as a street tree. Um, and they're often have sometimes they have pretty blossoms or sometimes um, I know the first time I saw a ginkgo tree was when I moved to New York City, not something that is um, in our forests here in upstate New York, naturally. And so I was like, what is this cool tree? Um, and so it just shows that it's a resource you don't always think about to learn about new trees and they're available right outside the door usually. Um, there's also most larger cities, even our city of Ithaca here, um, employs a city forester and it's their job to track those, those trees and um, make decisions about those trees and plant new trees and what to plant. Um, and they can be a great resource to learn from as well. Um, some project ideas that I have in um, my book while learning are making a map or a pamphlet for the trees in your neighborhood, either collectively in a group, um, you know, find out what those trees are, identify them, research them, and then make a tour for other people. Uh, research one tree in depth um, and share with your peers. Um, and then this picture is of uh, visiting a tree seasonally and drawing and writing about it. Um, 
And then we put it all together and make a book that follows that tree seasonally. So let's keep going. So um, nature images. So I just wanted to throw this in this section. This is the last slide in this section because um, it just shows the power of nature. And it was a 2021 um, study, and I put the link down here for you in case you're interested in it, um, that um, showed that viewing just the pictures of nature improved mood. So think about that when you're putting together presentations or class materials. Um, and how you can kind of integrate more nature in your materials. So using images in your slides, but also as writing prompts. You can, this is a picture, um, just looking at this picture makes me feel kind of relaxed. And you could talk about like, what is, what is he looking at? That little boy is looking up. Um, or what could be out in the forest? Or you could make this a setting. Um, you could put it in the background of something. You could use pictures or nature, like these slides have some nature in them, um, to add visual interest. And I also like to use nature and examples in my word problems in math. So it's just something to think about that even though we might think it doesn't have like a huge influence, um, even just pictures can boost our awareness. So moving on um, to connecting to nature and the outdoors at home. Um, I love, this is a picture of mud pies. Those are great for math, um, and using natural materials, all the things that we're going to talk about here. So one thing you can do at home is collect, um, natural materials, um, to use as, um, manipulatives, mostly in regards to math, but also you can see, you can use them in, uh, reading and writing. And, um, this is just a great way to get kids actively involved. Kids are naturally drawn to ma natural materials. It's a way to integrate nature into um, math and reading in an another way. And um, they can easily replace those plastic manipulatives. So if you're choosing things that are really common, that's the best way to, um, to do this. But um, they're also really affordable um, and kids really kind of love to add to their collection. So these are um, place value sticks. These are just bundles of sticks, uh, 10 sticks with a rubber band and in place of those base 10 blocks, uh, plastic base 10 blocks. Um, I also love to use chalk. We're gonna talk about that, but um, in we use natural materials in 10 frames. 10 frames are a really popular thing in uh, lower elementary math uh, to build um, numeracy skills, subitizing skills, um, addition. It's, it's a great tool um, and natural materials work really well in them. Um, same thing down here, this is uh, subitizing. So these are printed subitizing cards and they're just dots arranged um, in different ways. And um, then they take the natural materials and they have to recreate that pattern. You can also create that pattern, hide it, have them guess how many there are. So subitizing is the ability to look at something or a group of some things and tell how many things they are without counting. Um, babies actually can do this um, like really young, like under a year old, and they can distinguish between two items and uh, like three items or one items, I forget the exact amount. But you can tell when, a, this is a really foundational skill in math, and you can tell when kids don't have it. Um, they're the kids that will count every single dot on a die, like when you roll a dice, they, and you, you know, you get three, and they're counting one, two, three, or they have to count back every time. So if you gave them this, they would have to you know, if they mess up, they have to count back all the way over again, and they have to eat, count each one. They would not take that lower bottom and go three, four, five, six. That's, they're, they're not, they don't have that skill yet. So um, natural materials are really good for that. And then here I have taken some rocks with a permanent marker, and I wrote um, letters. You can also write numbers. Chalk works really well for temporarily doing this. Um, and we use them to write some words we are working on in our phonics work, and then marking them up, marking up words to show their particular sounds. So these are showing some long vowels with that little line. We put sticks above the vowel A and O to show that they are making the long sound. And I show kids how to do this um, with pen and pencil too, but this is a more multi-sensory, hands-on way to do this. You can do this 
outside as opposed to uh, stuck in the classroom if you want to practice a few things. And then a slash over that E in rate to show that it is a silent E, but in case that's new to you. Um, I have a lot of uh, videos on my social media explaining that kind of thing too. If that's something that's new to you and you're interested, um, it can really help kids um, boost those decoding skills and reading. So the other thing I love to do, whether I'm in the classroom or as a parent, is learning walks. And this is really capitalizing on what's outside our door. Um, they often, they can work in any environment. They work even better in a, a more developed area, as you can see maybe from these pictures. So um, math walks are, I usually just take one idea or one thing that we might be working on um, or want to look for, and we take a walk and we take our clipboards. And if sometimes it's really informal, if it's just my kids and we just walk and we're looking for those things. So um, this picture right here, we, uh, this is a multiplica multiplication class. We were working on multiplication and we are outside of the city hall and we were looking for arrays. So arrays are rows and columns. So like two by five or six by six. And here you could see that the panes and the glass make an array. This wire guard makes an array. The metal uh, thing that that girl is standing on is an array. And once the kids start seeing them, they go crazy. They see them everywhere because they're everywhere. Um, church windows, sidewalks, grates, it's all kinds of things. And it, you know, we drew them on graph paper and we recorded them. And some we found were so big, we just had to figure out how many were in them back in the classroom later because we just couldn't do it there. We needed a little more time. Um, you can also look for numbers like decimals. How many decimals will we see on this walk? Or let's round every number that we see to the nearest 10. Um, sometimes we take our protractors out and start measuring all the angles that we see and recording them. Um, I also talk a lot in my book about flower geometry, and I also use it for multiplication because six petals, right? Um, but they also make shapes. Uh, flowers have an amazing amount of geometry in them when you start looking. And so, um, kids love to find that out too. So you can look for shapes, whether in the natural world or in the built environment. Um, there's really no limit, but you can always think of something. And, uh, and every time you go, even if you've done that before, you will learn something new. Um, same idea with reading and writing, phonics, writing prompts. Um, some people don't think of all of these things as resources for teaching, reading, writing, phonics, um, but they're there and we should use them. They're free. And then once you go outside, remember you're getting all those benefits that we talked about in the beginning. So for example, um, this sign right here, the one way and right turn only, um, the words one and way are often those high frequency or words that people are um wanting their kids to learn. Um, the word right is an I-G-H word, um, which is a common phonics pattern or spelling pattern that we're working on. Um, there's also an R controlled vowel in turn. Um, and one and only are related and you could talk about um, that. And then, um, and that's just two signs. So um, just think of all the words you might see. Uh, sometimes if you're on a very, uh, like a, more of a campus and, and you can't go off that campus, um, you can s find a lot of phonics, especially for younger kids on license plates. So if you're really desperate, it's a great place to look. Um, the other place that people overlook are graveyards. Um, I do suggest that you check with families that they are okay. There are different cultural differences and acceptance of uh, visiting graveyards. But if it's a go, they can be a fantastic um, resource for phonics, reading, um, math, because there's so many dates. What's the oldest grave you can find? What's the uh, most recent grave? Um, and then you can link it to history. What was going on when this person was alive? Um, you know, there's often different sections on different wars. Um, 
what was our town like during this time? Or, and you can link it with your local library and find out more about a different person. Um, I've done reports with kids where kids choose somebody in the graveyard to research. And um, even if they can't find a lot about specific, they can find about um, what the world was like when they were their age or a different age um, and what the town was like. Um, it makes some generalizations based on their history knowledge. Um, historical signs are another thing we see a lot about here in New York. Um, but there's reading, there's phonics on here, and then there's the link to the history and the local place. So a lot of place-based learning. And then I have a picture of a mural slash graffiti here. And you're like, probably wondering, what does that have to do with reading and writing? Um, in my book, I have an activity for this, but, um, murals make great writing prompts. So make a story about this giant goldfinch um, or tell me what you think about the graffiti here. Uh, do you think this is good? Is this an expression of you know, self-expression? Should they be allowed to, th to do this? Should they not do some research, do a debate? Older kids, teens and preteens love this. Um, and it has them really thinking about it in a lot of different lenses. So it can be a great, great thing. And um, then I always uh, suggest um, this, which is making a nature collection, whether it's in your classroom or in your home. Um, it's just collecting small nature items and displaying them in a special place. I also like to have them fill out little cards. I think I have a picture of this in my book of um, where they got it, what it is, something about it, the date that they got it. Um, and then you can use these in a lot of different ways. On a rainy day, you can use them as writing prompts. Um, kids like to bring them in and share different objects. Um, they can compare and contrast. They can be drawing prompts where they have to look very closely. Um, they can use them for sorting and classifying them in different ways, Venn diagrams, dichotomous keys. Um, I, I often taught dichotomous keys with various objects like that, um, which is a great uh, science skill. So it's just an idea. Remember, though, to always have permission to collect whatever you're collecting. Um, it is illegal to collect in natural uh, national parks in the United States. Um, and you should try not to collect things that are rare or alive. <laughs> just some things to think about. I think I have some guidelines about that in my book as well. Um, and also, I just wanted to throw chalk out there. It's always one of my favorite low-cost ways to get kids outside and learning. Um, we use it for math and spelling and writing and playing games and, of course, making art. So here they just wrote out the multiples of three and they're jumping on them and they're shouting. Um, this is a game we play. Uh, this is a more advanced version. This is with prefixes and suffixes, but they have to uh, go in different directions to make different words. So like and then write them down like un, uh, undo or unreal or replay or retie, rewash, and, and make different combination of words. Number lines are great. This is an open number line. I have a whole video about this, if you're interested, um, on my Instagram, which I'll give to you at the end. And then down here, this um, boy is using um, Elkonin boxes, which are a great way to help kids zero in on sounds in words and break those words into their component sounds and then blend them together. The basics are each box has to have one sound, not necessarily one letter because there are letter combinations that make one sound like digraphs, like CH, right? That would C and H would go in one box. Um, so that's just a really useful tool I use a lot with kids and it works well outside with chalk. So, and then I think this is my final slide and I just wanted to end with noticing and reminding you that we're modeling really um, has an impact in when we model noticing and curiosity and wonder about the world and the natural world and being a lifelong learner that it really can encourage kids to be curious about their environment, to ask questions and to notice things. Um, and kids are really good at noticing things, um, but we don't always uh, 
show how valuable it is. And often adults come out, um, come off as kind of experts. And um, that can really actually feed into uh, children that have a lot of perfectionism because they feel like um, they have to, that they, they see adults in their lives always getting the right answer and always being perfect and always can do that and never making mistakes. And that's just not reality. And by showing kids things that you don't know or that you're wondering about, you can really um, counteract that and that everyone is still learning. Um, it also, of course, is a great opportunity for discussion, um, learning together, building those language skills and your vocabulary, which all feeds back to our reading comprehension. Um, and so it just really is a great thing to do. So that is the end of my presentation. I would love to know what I can help you with or what other questions you have. I have uh, my website, Discover Wild Learning, my email if you are too shy or you're watching the recording. Um, and then there's my social media, which is at Discover Wild Learning. And I post a ton of videos um, and how to's about teaching and, and things outside or whatever we may be doing. So, yeah. Wonderful, Rachel. So much great information. Thank you so much. And before I forget, Rachel's going to be back. So if you have any questions, take, go check out her book, read it. And then I'm going to put the link here in, uh, in the, uh, in the chat coming at you. Um, come meet and talk with Rachel. And we're going to be hosting another event uh, later, later this month. And that event is going to be on July 25th at 3 p.m. Pacific. So we hope to have you all back. That one is not gonna be broadcasted like this. It's gonna be an actual Zoom meeting where you can, you can ask questions, but you can drop your questions here in the chat now. And I, I just absolutely loved it. There's, uh, as someone who's got her teaching start as a naturalist and how I raised and taught my girls through how we homeschool, this information has just been fantastic. And so I want to, um, again, thank you for that. We also are going to be giving away some of Rachel's books. And so th while you're thinking of your questions, I'm going to go over how you can get a copy of Rachel's book besides ordering it from her website. Um, what we want to know is you can either put here in, in the chat, how are you going to take what you learned today and apply it with your learners? Um, you can also go to social media and tag out school, tag Rachel, and uh, you tell us there, how are you going to take your take what you learned from Rachel today and apply it? How are you using the nature? How, how are you going to be using nature to teach the academics? Um, so do that between now and Monday and Monday by five o'clock Pacific. Um, I should have some names for us to announce our, our winners. Um, we're going to give a total of six books of Rachel's away, three for t parents and three for teachers. So uh, just tell us, tag us, let us know what you are planning on doing from this session today. And speaking of sessions, Rachel is helping to kick off the July Great Out School campout. So we, besides having Rachel back um, at the end of the month, we have nature journaling with Ben Corey um, coming to you later this month. And I'm gonna also drop in um, the chat a link to OutSchool that's going to have all sorts of events for not just our learners, but also our parents and our educators um, to keep to keep the camping theme, the outdoor theme going. So check take a look at there. There's our there's a link for you to register and sign up for those different events. So again, um, Rachel's here. We're going to be having a, a teen event with Patagonia. Leave No Trace is going to be here for a learner event. We're going to have a few of our out school educators hosting. Um, some events with our learner community. Now, Rachel, I do have some questions that people have sent in and we have a few minutes here. I know we're kind of running out of time. So come back July 25th, bring all those questions for Rachel and bring your, bring your stories 
of how you've taken what you've learned today and how are you applying, how you applied it in the next few weeks. Um, so we want to hear those stories. Uh, so Rachel, I, I can understand this one. Um, I know your a lot of your information is geared towards in your curriculum are geared towards the younger learners. And what about those teens? Tips for older kids, maybe botany, zoology, geology, physics, beyond the ba basics of arithmetic and reading. Yeah, so I kind of um, alluded to that a little bit in my talk um, when I said you can go really deep with things like birds and plants, right? So that's hitting plants, hitting that botany. There is so much to learn about any one of those things um, that links to so many different things. Like even birds, you can talk about the physics of flight um, and why, you know, how that related to the development of airplanes and wings. And there's just so many connections and ways you can go starting with the basics. I will say that most, most kids, the high school, junior high, high school level don't really have those basics. Um, like I kind of, I said, like most of our plant stuff is or even just birds is so so very basic that going just a little bit beyond is something completely new to them um i have a degree in environmental science and analysis and i went to an all science college and um we took lots and lots and lots of science classes that went really really deep and there's just so many more you could go into but i never took a botany class until I went to college and I was most, mostly in chemistry. So um, it's just, it goes to show that you just not, I mean, beyond basic biology, which is very human based usually. Um, and there's like that quick plant unit quick and they rarely talk about birds or anything that's around you. Um, there's just so much more to the world than we're usually typically showing kids. So um, it's super easy to dive deep into anything or anything they're interested in. If something they see, that's why uh, walks, even at older ages, if you see something and you're intrigued by that red tailed hawk, you see dive into that, you know? So that's what I would suggest. Go deeper, not wider. I know. I know for my girls who are 14 and in high school now, just the nature journaling, because um, there's just always something to observe and to notice and then go deeper that way. And I was, thumbing through, I was thumbing through your book again after reading it, making some notes for myself. And um, I had the, the part about clouds. Yes. Right. And so I was reflecting back at something I would do with the twins when they were younger about sitting, you know, sitting on the ground, looking up and like, what, do, what, what images do we see in the clouds? And fast forward 10 years and we're still doing that. Yes. And they're creating stories of what they're seeing in the clouds. And just when you're taking that time to sit and be still, you're really engaging, you know, all of them as you, you talk about. And there's, we're such, we're in such a busy world. It's so great to pause and take a moment yes. and to see. That's um, why okay. I sit spots for any age. Yeah, I'm sit spots are great. Um, someone said, asked a question about um, how do you keep them curious? Like, how do you keep feeding that curiosity? Yeah, I mean, it kind of, it goes back to that last slide is my main um, thoughts on this is that when we're modeling being curious, whether it's about nature or anything in life, or just wondering about things and being really honest that we don't know everything and that we're still learning and that that's that's the point of life to keep learning about things. Um, I know <laughs> this came up, I took a bunch of kids to, to ice cream in our neighborhood and we're sitting there and um, I don't, we, we're newer to this, we just moved to this neighborhood and so I don't know all the kids a lot, but we're sitting there and we're talking about um, white chocolate versus chocolate and whether white chocolate was real chocolate or not. And we debated it for a while. I mean, I don't hardly know these kids. And then I, then I whipped out Google on my phone and we, we learned that it really is chocolate. Um, and then, you know, we talked about it, but just that kind of like, Oh, I don't know. Does anybody know? And we're kind of piecing it together, but just kind of that modeling that we're all always learning and curiosity and wondering 
and valuing that, um, I think is amazing for any topic and especially um, nature. And so if you're like, oh, wow, look at this really cool moss everyone, what did they do? Or this really, we saw a millipede today um, and it was black and, and yellow. And we're like, look at this really cool thing. And some kids said it was a millipede and some kids said it was a centipede. And all the adults were like, well, we don't really know, but then we looked it up and then we figured it out. And so, um, you know, that collective excitement gets kids excited and, and keeps them engaged. Um, and so I think just doing that as much as you can, even if you kind of have to fake it as an adult, sometimes that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so much wonderful information uh, from you today, Rachel. So again, uh, we are going to have a meeting and and with Rachel. In the oh. comments. I don't know if you saw that. No. But it, it, it's quick. So it's, have you found kids more keyed into concepts with outdoor learning as they are seeing real world, world applications and discovering things for themselves? Mm -hmm. And absolutely, yes. Um, this is especially true with kids that um, are not your, don't learn as well in the traditional sense of listening and writing. Um, there is a large subset, I think it's larger than we realize, that learn really well from hands on, or it doesn't really make sense until they see it or see why it matters. And so those connections may be like, birds in flight and see the relationship. Uh, that's a real connection to a physics concept that can seem really abstract. Um, and you can do that with anything. And when you're touching and doing math or phonics or seeing the phonics on the sign in the neighborhood, you're like, oh, this is really important. Like it's right here, like on the sign that's warning me of danger or whatever, fire. Um, and so I, I definitely see that. Um, and I think it's really important. And I think we should do more of it. Awesome. So bring those questions, June tw or July 25th. Um, I dropped the link and, uh, in, the ch in the chat here. Um, and come and meet Rachel and ask your questions there. Also, don't forget that we are giving away several of her books. And the way you can be one of the six recipients is to share uh, after you either watch the recording, um, as you reflect, share here how you are planning on taking what you've learned and putting it into practice. You can also just share on your own social media, but you need to tag out school so that we can see that um, and, or and tag Rachel. Um, mm -hmm. Go check out go check out her her Instagram, her videos, and keep the learning, keep that curiosity um, alive with yourself because our our kids are gonna uh, are gonna catch that too. So on behalf of oh, Jennifer. one other quick thing, Aaron, I'm having some technical problems, but Aaron's gonna drop the link to our survey. We'd love you to complete that. Um, it will be in the comments so we can get your feedback. And thank you so much for being here. And we'll look forward to welcoming Rachel back just in another week and a bit um, yeah. for the meet and greet. So please join us. This was yeah. terrific. Bring your questions. I'd love to chat to people that are into this. So I'm really excited. All right. We will get that chat here in the, or that survey here in the chat in just a moment. So thank you everybody for, for joining us. And we'll see you on the 25th.